Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. So, let's go and talk about one of the most hotly requested topics out there right now. We're going to talk about Throne Worlds. There have been a lot of things going around the community, and some of them represent huge misconceptions that need to be addressed. We'll be looking to explain Savathun's Throne World and the dynamics behind Throne Worlds generally, and so, as a result, we're going to start by explaining how Throne Worlds actually work. But the thing is, in order to understand how throne worlds work, you need to understand the Ascendant Plane. So, let's go ahead and start there. And we can start with something from this season, the Season of the Lost, with Petra's explanation of how it compares to the material world. Her coin analogy is actually a really good one. Take a listen. Imagine the universe as a set of coins, stacked one on top of the other. The top coin is our reality. The bottom the Ascendant Plane. Between them lies an intermeshing of ever-shifting pathways known as Ley Lines. Almost all the ancient pathways are now defunct, but beings of paracausal ability can navigate and rebuild them. This is the art of wayfinding. This explanation is a really important one going forward. We'll definitely be referring back to it from time to time in future videos. Petra also sums up a pretty complicated concept really well, but there's more that gets explained throughout a bunch of stuff in different dialogue in the Season 2. I really do love, by the way, that Bungie is finally clarifying some of the finer details on all of this, because this is some subject matter that I personally have been asking about for well over half a decade now. I've been trying to understand the various crossovers between the Material Universe and the Ascendant Realm, and now we finally know it. The crossovers are the Ley Lines, the Ascendant Realm is essentially like an upside down, like a far apart dimension from our Material Universe. But, all the same, we have more yet to talk about. There are some things that you should know about the Ascendant Plane, which is where things begin to get really complicated. You see, as you can all probably tell by just looking at its chaotic nature, I think it's easy to understand that the Ascendant Plane doesn't quite work in the same fashion as our Material Plane does. The laws of physics in the universe generally are different in the Ascendant Plane. Paracausal beings and those with exceptionally strong wills, potentially, are able to bend the Ascendant Plane to their will. I say those with exceptionally strong wills because we still don't understand quite what the exact notion of having a strong will is going to do in the Ascendant Plane. Essentially, you have material that is more psychomutable, something that can be bent by somebody's thoughts, and it makes me question whether we'll see Scions in the Ascendant Plane at any point in the future, and if we do, what their abilities and their powers are. This might ultimately unlock the true key to understanding it, but at current the safest assumption is that paracausal beings truly are the only ones who can actually have an effect here. Having said that, keep that in mind, because if this is a truly psychomutable space, that makes things a lot more interesting. Again, psychomutable meaning just changing things with your mind. It's in these spaces of the Ascendant Realm, however, that we're all much more powerful as Guardians, given our powers of light and dark, which allow us to naturally break the rules of the universe. In the Ascendant Plane, however, all of this can be taken to yet another extreme. Those who are sufficiently strong will be able to create their own spaces within the Ascendant Plane that effectively become pocket universes. We know a great deal about the makeup of the Ascendant Plane thanks to the lore found in Forsaken, which effectively tells us about the overall makeup of the entire plane in some specific details. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of those details, but what I will tell you is that this information looks like it's incomplete, and some of it from various perspectives might be lies or incorrect, as per usual. Some of our knowledge from this comes from Hive entities, and some of them like to lie, astoundingly enough. For the moment, however, this is what I believe the makeup of the Ascendant Plane looks like. The general area of the Ascendant Plane is known as the Sea of Screams. This is the formless, swirling mass of darkness that can be found throughout the Ascendant Plane, most likely. It's probably the reason why all you can see when you enter the general areas of Ascendant Spaces is this mass of swirling darkness, which for me at least is honestly the creepiest thing about the entire place, because I imagine what's inside the terrible dark spaces, which appear to go on forever and could contain giant monsters for all I know. Yeah, great. 
However, there are metaphorical islands within this Sea of Screams, and these are known colloquially as Throne Worlds. And Throne Worlds are essentially dimensions within dimensions that exist in the Ascendant Plane and are influenced by their creators. To an extent, those creators are able to influence and control whatever occurs within that Throne World. And this is where I need to start providing a few examples so that you can better understand them. As a quick note though, you don't have total control. If Oryx sits there and sees someone enter his throne world, he can't just snap his fingers and have them turn into cotton candy. There are rules and there are limitations in place. There are most certainly going to be things that are implemented by each entity that has created their throne world. So keep that in mind. The amount of power that you are granted is proportional to how powerful you are, but by that same token, you lay down some rules, and those rules are underpinned by the logic of what gives you paracausal power. Anyway, here's a few examples of throne worlds that will help you better understand throne worlds generally. First of all, we need to talk about Toland the Shattered. Toland is a warlock who embraced the idea of the sword logic and is found constantly throughout both the Ascendant Plane and on the moon where he died. Well, he died in the Ascendant Plane, but he went there after having gone to the moon. And that's a long story for another time. He died at the hands of Ur Yut, the Death Singer, and back before Destiny's story was really starting to come to the fore in the space of Destiny 2, Toland was one of the most important characters in the story, especially when Oryx and Crota were concerned. As it turns out, his belief in the sword logic and the darkness generally rewarded him because those principles and the power that he probably gained from them meant that he was able to create a throne world, albeit not a very impressive one. However, this means that he was in some way able to survive death. Mara Sov discovered this during her travels within the Ascendant Plane after she was freed from the subjugation under the Taken King Oryx. Long story, but we'll talk about that one in a bit. The lore entry telling us a bit more about Toland's throne world comes from the Reverie Dawn Gloves, which reads as follows. She travels across the Ascendant Plain. The voyage across the Sea of Screams threatens to erode her edges as no other trial ever has. In Oryx's throne world, she had a semblance of an identity. Treasure, spoil of war, defeated queen, repugnant and alien, and not me. But she could use these contortions as guideposts to trace her way back to herself. Here, in the emptiness between throne worlds, she has nothing but what she can carry. The burden is growing heavier, but she is not alone. He tries to speak to her from a place of high contempt. In doing so, he invites her into his topography. She steps out of the howling and finds her footing upon a plane of swords and madness and all-consuming curiosity. Who are you? The question summons an almost forgotten answer deep within the rapidly solidifying shape of her. I am Mara Sov. Starlight was my mother and my father was the Dark. The thing that once was called Toland flees before her darkness, light, shadow, majesty. She rests within this scrap of a world before resuming her journey through the Howling. Toland, as it turns out, there has a throne world, albeit quite a pathetic one in comparison to some of the others. Seems like it's just kind of a scrap of land and not much more than that. He built his throne world through his understanding of the sword logic, the key principles of the darkness, and using those principles of the darkness, he has been granted power enough to carve out that small portion of the Ascendant Plane into a throne world. However, he's not the first to do so, and he certainly isn't the most impressive. For that, we need to look at some of the Hive Gods. We'll start with the son of Oryx, Crota, a Light Eater. Crota was the final boss of the Dark Below expansion and the main antagonist of it. This was all the way back in Destiny 1. And Crota is also an important Hive character, as his death at our hands was basically the inciting incident for the Taken King expansion, and that has repercussions that we are seeing now today. Oryx's defeat in the Taken King effectively informed Savathun's strategy, and made her realize perhaps what she is starting to realize now, that the darkness was not, in fact, always the ultimate power in the universe. Anyway, back to Crota, who, of course, we killed, setting off this massive chain of events. 
The Crota's End raid, where this happened, sees us traveling through a keyhole in reality at the bottom of the Hellmouth in order to enter his throne world. His throne world, as best we can tell, is referred to as the Oversoul Throne, and it's almost certainly bigger than Tolan's on account of Crota being able to shape the vast spaces of the Ascendant Plane into an image better fitting and exalting his own, as well as his beliefs in the Sword Logic. Crota did all of this through the power of the Sword Logic, and back in the early days of Destiny, it was thought that the Sword Logic was the only thing that could accomplish this feat, the only thing that could build a throne world. It's something that is again expanded upon in Forsaken with the Mindbender. The Mindbender is one of the eight Scorn Barons that helped Aldrin to kill Cade Six back in the Forsaken campaign, and his unique shtick was his link to the Hive. He was able to control them after having fallen into the Hellmouth on the moon. We're not sure how deep his connection to all of this goes, and we don't know exactly what happened when he fell down into the Hellmouth, but we do know that he came out much more powerful and with the ability to control the Hive, mind-bending them. What we also know is that this deep connection to the Hive allowed him to build a throne world, and we know that because in the Baron Hunt in Forsaken where we go after him, we had to go into his throne world in order to kill him. Our ghost even makes commentary that the Mindbender's throne world was probably as big as it was because he had been one of those who had killed Cade. This, for those of you who aren't in the loop, is how sword logic works. Effectively, it is the act of proving your worth by a right of conquest. When you kill something, you prove that you are more powerful and are exalted and made more powerful as a result. And this is kind of how everything works. It's social Darwinism turned up to 11 and given some really nasty teeth. However, sword logic, as I hinted to, isn't necessarily the only way to create a throne world, and we see this thanks to Mara Sov and Riven of a Thousand Voices, the last Ahamkara. Mara Sov is the Queen of the Awoken, and has a unique brand of paracausal abilities that are probably as a result of her being born, of both light and darkness. Her and Riven of a Thousand Voices, the last of the Wish Dragons, worked together after the death of Crota to create a throne world for Mara. They built this throne world so that Mara was able to survive death and would be able to enact her great plan to defeat Oryx, the Taken King. Mara's throne world was carved out using the paracausal power of both herself and Riven, but it's not stated that they used darkness explicitly. The exact lore entry for this is from the Dreaming City lore book, and appropriately enough, it is called Throne. It reads as follows. Eris returned to the Vestian outpost. Because she spoke well, it was agreed that aid would be traded for intelligence and a long-term alliance. In this way, the Awoken were the first to know of the Great Navigator, his philosophies, his strategies, his weaknesses. And as the Coven contemplated the possibilities laid wide before this god-king's far-flung sword, it was decreed that they would build a throne world beneath an energy well as blind as the ferryman Charon. Naskia drew the schematics. Portia worked out the calculations. They made their first test with a small rift generator on the eastern shore. Satisfied that their methods were sound, they then went to a grand cathedral to dig the well. There, Lysel and Sadia augured the first borehole with the help of Riven, who had taken the shape of a needle-nosed basilisk, while Kali and Shuro Chi constructed the gate itself, deep below, in a hall they named the Confluence. Ilan made tincture after tincture of queen's foil until her clothes stank and her hands were stained reddish-black. Open-eyed, she walked between planes and sorted the threads of reality on a vast metaphysical loom, weaving some closer, some more distant. Mara and Riven shaped her third throne together, and the artistry of their work was a testament to the hungry joy they felt in that partnership. They named it Eleusinia, and it was in those ascendant halls that Mara finally carved a statue for sure. When it came time to connect the well to the unreality that lay beyond the gateway, Sadia asked, Would it not be wiser to leave this door without a key? Riven, 
now an immense antlered serpent with broad tiger paws, tightened around the perimeter of the room like a noose. Egg, Mara corrected absently, chewing on her thumbnail. The key is so heavy as to be unliftable, Callie ventured, since they were speaking metaphorically. Sadia flapped her hand dismissively. Yes, yes, I know. They all knew that the gate required a continuous multi-week charge of paracausal energies, and that almost nothing in the solar system could produce such energies at the scale required by the gateway. Almost. It's just... do we... Do we wish to trust the Guardians? Ilan filled in dryly. Mara ran her hand along the sleek surface of the primary well's control mechanism. Then turned and walked alone toward the fresh, foggy air that blew in from the coast. The Tekkens watched her go. There is only the plan, Elan said. Remember your vows, Sadia. What we essentially learned from all of this is that throne worlds don't need to be created through darkness. They perhaps can just be created through paracausal power when applied correctly within the Ascendant Plane. So now you have an idea of how they're made. Now we need to look into how they work and what the point of having them is. The first thing to know about throne worlds is that they grant a form of faux immortality to their creators. They can do this because if a being with a throne world dies in our material plane, they will be reborn in their throne world within the ascendant plane. They will have all their memories intact, assuming there hasn't been some kind of memory wiping effect and they'll be able to go on fighting over and over. Throne worlds in this sense are a little bit like a giant dimensional version of a lich's phylactery from D&D. The difference here is that you don't destroy the phylactery to kill the monster here. Instead, you have to kill the monster inside of its throne world to kill it properly. This leads us to the next big detail about throne worlds, which is that they're essentially giant dimensional fortresses. Hive gods are typically the ones using throne worlds, and these throne worlds will oftentimes contain the greatest concentrations of their elite forces. They might also be naturally fortified against assault as a means of defeating those invaders, wherever they might come from. For Oryx, this manifested as his Dreadnought, a throne world that was also a paradox, a throne world that had been turned inside out and was now manifested within the physical plane. This is truly a unique feat, and it's something that is very much running against the norm. But back in that day, this just shows you how powerful Oryx was. The Hive even dedicate a day to this entire process where the throne world of Oryx was turned inside out, and they celebrate that day by doing that exact thing to other things. They turn things inside out. The Hive really are a weird people. Anyway, Oryx's paradox throne world aside, for Crota, his throne world was protected at the bottom of the Hellmouth, and before you could even get to it, you had to pass through the stills, the darkest and deepest part of that hive fortress that descended so far into the depths that light didn't touch it. On top of that, if it wasn't enough to have to go through the stills and the legions of hive that would be fighting against you, you also then have the further problem when you actually get inside of the defenses that you'd find there. Not only do you find Annihilator Totems, which again appear in Oryx's Throne World, but you also found the Throne World's namesake, the Oversoul. The Oversoul is basically a massive death sphere. They describe it as a Thanatosphere in Destiny's Lore, and if given the correct prompting, it can basically detonate and kill everything in that Throne World, at least everything that is an invader. It only makes sense that all of these defenses are in place, as if it is the place where you can actually die, there is a reason to have such dogged persistence and perseverance to your forces. However, the power of throne worlds doesn't quite end there. The creators of throne worlds are able to enforce the rules of their throne worlds, and we can tell this from a few bits of lore in the Destiny 1 Grimoire, and in particular the Note of the Ascendant Sword card and verse 4-9 in the Books of Sorrow. Verse 4-9 in the Books of Sorrow describes the assault of the Vex against Oryx's throne world, and how they were able to gain a purchase within it. Take a listen to this excerpt. The Vex clattered around, constructing large problems. 
At first, their constructions were deranged because they didn't understand the sword logic, which defined all rules in Oryx's throne world. The geometry perplexed them. I'll cut them apart, Crota said, but just then, the Vex ritual of better thoughts manifested a mind called Coria Blade Transform. Coria deduced the sword logic. I have to kill everything, Coria resolved. Then I will be powerful. Crota's gate began to emit warrior Vex, huge and brassy. He leapt forward to fight them, but they blinked away. After they fled from Crota, they killed 2,000 of Oryx's acolytes and 10,000 of his thrall. Soon they had established themselves as powers in this world by right of slaughter. Because Oryx established his throne world and dictated that the laws of the sword logic would be the laws that would hold sway, the Vex were able to gain a purchase within it, and then they emulated those laws to do so. Oryx and Crota both established this law as the law that would underpin their throne worlds, and it's expressed well within the Ascendant Sword Grimoire card, which describes the power of the Hive's Ascendant Swords and the Sword Logic generally, before saying, Understand that this nightmare logic underpins his nightmare world, and you will see why the Ascendant Blade has so much power there. Whenever in our passage we find ourselves in need of power, remember that the greatest authority here is a blade made keen by eons of use. Now here's the important thing to understand, and it's something that we need to talk about, because this is one of the biggest misconceptions running around. Everything I've just told you might not necessarily be true, so let me explain. There are these pretty plain statements that have just been said in the lore. The devs have even stated that Savathun's throne world is one in which we will need to play by her rules. This idea is foundational to how we manage to kill Crota, and it makes something really clear, which is that the sword logic, at very least, is something that holds power in the Ascendant Plane to a degree. However, the way that Oryx died implied that throne worlds and the Ascendant Plane generally respect power rather than merely the sword logic, and that the laws imposed or enacted in a throne world do not always need to be abided by, it's perhaps merely the simplest way one can gain power. You see, when we killed Oryx, we did so in a rather unique manner. During the assault on the Taken King, he unleashed Light Eater Ogres in the encounter, and when killed, they dropped massive blights of corrupted light. We then activated these massive blights and freed the corrupted light within. This choice to free the light was important because it defied the sword logic and therefore goes against the grain of the sword logic power that has been stated as the rules of Oryx's throne world. This is not the same power that was used and proven to be useful by Quoria and the Vex or Oryx and his brood. We defied the rules of this world in order to kill the Taken King. Now granted, we also killed Oryx using a bit of sword logic because he had his doxology attack, which was a moment at which he claimed that he was the strongest thing within his throne world, and by that right he alone should exist. And by dealing enough damage to him in the middle of this attack, he essentially was proven wrong, and the doxology does not work and doesn't kill us. Even after this is done, it states that Oryx has regained favor with the darkness as a note that the next phase of the fight is going to begin. But it's the actual freeing of that corrupted light that makes a difference here because that's what reduces his HP to zero. We killed Oryx in his throne world with the power of the light, not the darkness, using what is literally called bomb logic and not sword logic. This throws the principle of a god's rules being absolute within their throne world completely out of the window, and I think it means that we can start to boil down the way that throne worlds work into a few really simple principles, which is as follows. Firstly, a throne world, much like anywhere in the Ascendant Plane, respects the power of paracausal individuals and awards them the greatest strength within their bounds. Secondly, the underpinnings of a throne world and the means by which most individuals must gain power within that world are dictated by the rules that have been selected by the creator of that throne world, and those rules and those laws are exalted within that throne world. The Vex, being causal and not paracausal, needed to use the sword logic or to emulate the sword logic to gain power in Oryx's throne worlds. Guardians, however, being paracausal beings, 
could absolutely still do this, and it was probably the easiest route to power, but we were perhaps able to ignore such rules in the circumstances where power to circumvent them arose. And so, when the Light Eater Ogres were released and the light was given to us in great plentitude, even in its corrupted form, we were able to free it, and therefore a new avenue of power was made available to us. This is kind of the basic principle. Paracausal power is everything. And whilst this is something that I think Bungie is still in the place where they need to kind of expand on it, I do believe that this is how things work, observing the laws that have been set down in Destiny 1, thanks to Crota and Oryx, as well as the various other throne worlds that we've explored, and the general dynamics of power within the Ascendant Plane. So, those are the basics, and I realize I'm explaining that now, and it's about 25 or 30 minutes into the video, so if you've not done anything, Go and grab some water and maybe take a break, pause the video and come back in a sec, because we're about to talk about Savathun's throne world. And yeah, this is where we're going to apply all of that knowledge. Okay, you back? Good, let's start. First of all, let's talk general stuff. If Savathun has built a throne world in a manner that empowers her, and if she does successfully discard her worm at the end of the season of the Lost, I feel Savathun's power in her throne world is no longer going to be underpinned by the sword logic, but instead by the power of deception and the weakness born of ignorance. This seems to be the power that Savathun has held onto and is attempting to use as the pivot towards her becoming her next great evolution. It's the kind of power that she has been attempting to enact, and she mentions constantly that she's trying to evolve beyond the fight of light and darkness, and is trying to become, as Oryx's law might say, axiomatic to ignorance, and to the lack of knowledge that comes from ignorance. Secondly, no, the Lucent Brood aren't a result of Savathun's throne world. I've seen so many people saying this online, I don't understand why, but people are saying that Savathun's Lucent Brood, the Hive Guardians, are only able to exist in Savathun's throne world because she makes the rules there. And I feel like in this moment we need to go ahead and sort of drill down on the whole her rules, her throne world kind of philosophy. Because I'm pretty sure that whilst you can go ahead and extend the rules of your throne world somewhat to whatever you believe, this is getting to be a bit too far. Aside from anything else that implies that we have the sort of physical evidence of her taking these ghosts and using some other method of actually creating them, no, if paracausal beings are created in the process of all of this, they're not bound to one universe, they're not bound to Savathun's throne world. In fact, they probably can exist in the material world. So yeah, not good. But also, nothing to do with Savathun's throne world, just the forces that she's marshalling there. Terrifying paracausal forces that most definitely could have an effect on it. Terrifying in another sense, because again, they're using the light. But probably nothing to do with the fact that Savathun's throne world is the place in which we fight them, and is a place in which she is able to determine some of the rules. Even after all of that stuff with the Lucent Brood, I think it's important to understand the gravity of all of this. If this was something that happened as a result of Savathun's throne world, then it begs the question of why Oryx didn't just have us walk through a hallway of literal, infinite, unbreakable knives and tear ourselves to pieces, or why we couldn't just instantly be deleted outside of Oryx's very specific doxologies, or why we weren't just stopped from using the light which gave us our power altogether. Savathun's throne world is a big unknown, but I'm going to firmly put my opinion in the ground as this stake here that reads, yeah, definitely not how that works. The Lucent Brood are their own thing, and they are not as a result of the throne world. Ultimately as well, I think it's worth noting that Savathun's throne world maybe is embodying a lot of the characteristics of her as a character. Yes, you have your very typical hive fortress, but it's also a place which is this massive swamp. And of course, throughout all of it, it appears that there's going to be secrets and deception, and in some of the trailers you can even see something that reveals hidden pathways being used, and that sort of seems to imply that everything about the throne world is built on deception, and is built with the purpose of leading people astray. I can imagine that for those who aren't powerful enough in paracausal abilities, those swamps would go on forever. 
like, could you imagine that? The perfect and ultimate deception trick is effectively like a hall of mirrors on a giant scale. I think that's entirely what it would be. And that's not even to speak of the various eldritch abominations that we might be able to find inside the throne world itself. And of course, there is the biggest unknown quantity of Savathun's throne world, which is the pyramid ship in the middle of it all. And the thing is, I don't know enough to understand why this is here. The thing that we can say is that Savathun and the Darkness are no longer allied. They are no longer working together, and so the presence of this thing indicates that this is somewhat of a three-way war. But what is it here for? Is this a spoil of war? Has Savathun conquered it? Is this a beachhead for an invasion? Is this a relic and a repository of some hidden knowledge that she needs? Is it a conduit through which Savathun once communed with the darkness? None of this is clear, but we know that the new raid is taking place inside the pyramid's depths. If we're to adequately understand the repercussions of the pyramid being there, we'll need to venture inside it. And that is going to be the biggest mystery of the throne world. Not simply what lies within its depths, not simply what Savathun has waiting for us, not simply the lies and deception on stage for us to see, but whatever lies within this pyramid. And with that, I want to thank everyone for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, go ahead and leave a like. I know it was a very long one, so thank you very much for watching and staying all the way to the end if you did. And of course, if you want more Destiny content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on notifications. I have a lot of content lined up for you guys, and we should be releasing once every other day. So expect a video every two days for the foreseeable few weeks. It's, yeah, I have lots of topics. I'm looking over at my board right now, so if my audio sounds a little different, that's why. But looking at it, we've written scripts on about half of them, and I've written down a lot of topics that you guys have suggested. And that's also not including all of the new story stuff that's going to come up with the Season of the Lost time over time. So we have a lot to cover, and we have a long season to do it in. So if you have any suggestions, please let me know. In the meantime, though, thank you very much for listening. If you did enjoy this again, leave your thoughts down below in the comments, subscribe, bell next to subscribe, like all the algorithm things that will really help this video out. And of course, know that as per usual, your viewership is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife, Parodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside. <laughs>